report put out by the White House very recently, nothing to do with the President, some put out by various departments in the United States government. And you can see in here, India is the rapidly growing greenhouse gas emissioner in the world. And you can, there were 6.3% of the emissions last year. The rate of growth in, in this particular place is India leading the charge. However, if you look at the uh, right hand side, the growth as per capita, of course, is still very low, but however, we are going very fast. And this is closely linked to economic activity in any country. You can see in the West, the, the growth of the greenhouse gases very rapid in, between the, in the years between 50 and 1990. And now they are slowing down. And as a result of it, the GDP is also growing down. But one concept which we have to remember is GDP, growth of GDP has necessarily nothing to do with the G and happiness of the people. So we have to de-link now. This is what people talk about. The, there is a lot of uh, thought in this country. GDP keep growing. That means the country is progressing very well. And the material, it may be progressing. But in terms of the happiness index, it is going further down and down and down. So there is no link between the GDP and how well the people live in a country. And hopefully for today's my message is simply, how do we bring back, with without growing GDP, how to bring back the society much higher level with happiness. And that is what the message I want to give today. And, and this is the traffic today. This is a Delhi. And you can see most of the roads are clogged. And this is a typical scenario when the GDP grows, the aspirations of the people are going to grow. As a result, of course, everybody would like to have a personal car or the transportation which has nothing to do with the rest of the population. And this is the normal for any population around the globe. And this is, of course, causing all the problems which you live with. Most of the people in this country know what is happening in Delhi. You can't even breathe. So the thing which went three years ago, I was in Delhi for a visit, visiting some minister. And when I saw the traffic and then folks I coming from the United States flying down, first thing I realized is I can breathe and uh, essentially I have help. Immediately I can see that the air is, air is very bad. So I was, there was a minister at the time. I was visiting a minister which is Minister of Science and Technology at the time. And then I told him, I said something has to be done about this problem here. And that is how this project has started. And I will show you the progress of the project, where we are and what we need to be doing to solve this particular problem. And these are the commonly used cars in India. So I gathered some information and found out. And you can see this is essentially the Maruti, which most of you uh, know about it. Maruti Alto, and the middle one is, I think, Wagner, and the third one is the Desire. And these are the cars mostly used for taxis and for personal transportation. And there are about half a million cars are getting gold every year in this country. There are two things you can do with this. Either you get rid of the car or you recycle the material which is in the car. And in fact, the recycling of the car is not that simple because it takes a lot of energy to do that. And the governments are also saying, for example, in Delhi and Kerala and some other government, Maharashtra, I understand is imposing rules where you cannot have a car more than 10 years old on the road. So you have a dilemma here. What do you do? You want to get rid of all these millions of cars, because every year you have half a million cars coming onto the road. What do you do with these cars? And you cannot simply go around and throwing around and recycle these cars, because a lot of materials get wasted. And a conventional economy, those things, those things will not get used. They go, go into the dumpster. So that is not what we like to do. So instead, what I propose to do is, we want to have a personal and shared mobility for climate change mitigation. Essentially, we cannot change the climate change. Whatever is happening is going to happen. But what we want to do is we want to reduce the greenhouse gases, which are going to be emitted by all these cars in, on the roads. And the two, one particular thing which I want to focus is on the shared mobility. The personal mobility is OK, but the shared mobility is the key. It's such a shared mobility meaning essentially the cabs, the buses, and the public transportation. But here, what we want to do is I want to focus on the automobiles. You see on the right hand side there is a picture, that is not a old picture, most of you have not seen this year. If you go to Calcutta, which I was there about three weeks ago, most of the cabs are essential ambassadors which were made in 1960s and 50s. And they still, they were in Kirsten. And if you see on the streets of Calcutta, you can even breathe. Every day this is the story, there are close to 150 parts per million by volume of the air pollution. And what the government prescribes is about 40 parts per million by volume. So this is a problem. 
So what do we do with this? So what I want to do is I want to somehow transform this kind of a scenario into what is called a sustainable using the sustainability processes. Now the word is used very loosely. Most of you, of course, you have been hearing this word uh, all the time. And what I want to first define what I mean by sustainability in this particular context. And, and there are three aspects to the sustainability. Of course, this some of you may have seen it. One is the environment, that the first component is environment, and the second one is the economics, and the third one is what is called equity. And what I mean by it is the energy conversion process, whatever we are going to do with the car. We take the IC engine car, we're going to convert into something else which is not going to provide give out any greenhouse gas emissions. Whatever the process it, it is, it has to be that greenhouse gas has to be zero. So that means the total system has to produce zero, not the single component. For example, what you see today, most of the cars, electric cars are going to be lithium ion batteries. And that isn't a greenhouse, some completely zero greenhouse gas solution. Because the material lithium has to be mined and that produces a lot of greenhouse gases and it can be processed that produces a lot of greenhouse gases. You have to make the batteries that produce a lot of greenhouse gases. So whatever you want to do, the complete solution has to be none of these processes in total produce any greenhouse gases. So we'll figure out what we want to do. And now the second part of this resource input and the waste are to be minimized. Whatever you're going to use, economic systems, the second component is the economic systems that harmoniously work with the nature. It becomes essential social equity. In this country, you see for the rich and the poor, you can see the gap is widening all over the world. So whatever we do in the economic sense, it has to provide equity among all the participants which are going to participate in this endeavor. So we have, in this particular case, for example, a taxi driver, you want to make sure whatever you, you are going to do, the driver which is going to drive the car has to benefit the most. Because if he benefits the most, the people are he's going to treat his family better and the society at large is going to benefit. So that's what we mean by the economic system. I want to talk that this is also what is new concept called circular economy. Most of the economic things which you are talking about now is what's called either linear economy or standard economy, where you buy a cell phone, for example, and you use the cell phone, what do you do? You go back and return the cell phone and you get a new phone. The guy what is exit the battery, everything else is thrown into the waste. And that is called the regular regular economy or linear economy. What we are going to do is, we are going to define another economy called circular economy, which I am going to talk to you in a little minute. And the next one is equity. What do we know equity? That means the social impact and as such that society as large has to benefit. So whatever we do in this process, everything, even social economy has to, the entire economy has to get benefit out of this. Now, what I want to do is, now what do we do? This is sustainable mobility. This is what the buzzword they use. But I particularly say, we say the Indian context. So what we want to do, we want to take all these user cars which are on the road, which are going to convert them into electric vehicles. And it will, so essentially what we're doing is we're extending the life of the car. So that's what we're trying to do. And what we want to, we want to make it affordable, because there's no point in making electric car, which is nobody is going to afford it. And it will be, it essentially is going to be produced by, not by factory, where few hands are going to be there. That is what most automobile factories are going to do. The, one of the biggest problems in India is the employment creation. That's what we want to create employment. You want to create employment in the two tire towns. It's not going to be in Hyderabad. These, these things are going to happen. It has to happen all around the towns here in the, in, the, in the country. So what we want to do is, whatever the technology we're going to provide, it has to be produced by a whole bunch of people as opposed to a fewer number of people. And that is what we mean by the economics. That's what, what we want to do. And the second one is, in this particular case, the transport, the owner or the driver, whoever owns the car, in this particular being the largest beneficiary. We want to keep the cars kept as long as possible through multiple service lives. That means one life is over. Essentially what you have right now is IC engine and you have a gasoline or petrol or some other CNG. We want to get rid of that. So we're going to create that car to another life. And the second life is going to be today interim basis. We're going to have lithium ion batteries. But that's all interim basis. Now when that is over, either you recycle those batteries. Now that car life, we have to do another life to this. And I'm going to show you what the third life for that car is going to be. And that is going to be the mostly truly sustainable solution which, which I'm going to provide uh, present to you today. And then the maximum value has to be extracted from the car. What do we mean by that? If one person drives all the way from the city to here when this morning I came, it took almost took an hour. And that is not the most efficient way to travel. I should have had three more people in the car who are coming in the same direction. So essentially what you want to do is, when you're using this car, it steps much maximum value has to be extracted from it. And that is what the circular economy. Third one is material in the car are recovered, regenerated, they have the feature life. And this essentially for every product you what you are using has to follow this process.
and this is called circular economy. When you do that, GDP doesn't have to go on for you, for the country to get better. That is not the, that. So what you have to do is the resources which you have right now has to be used efficiently and recycle, recycle it and reuse it. Then what happens is, what is the ultimate goal? Ultimate goal is you want to be happy for whatever you are doing. Ultimately, everybody wants to be happy, is that right? That's what we are all, hopefully, that's all we are living for. Whatever we do, it has to be self-satisfaction, not for some other guy. So what we want to do is, the initiative is, a system of resource utilization, essentially a reduction, reuse, and recycle elements essentially dominate in the, in the activity which we do. So, we, there are a company, there are young people like, like here, there are about three youngsters got together, listening to all this, and said they started a company called Itrio. And essentially what they do, they buy these used cars. And when we take out the entire IC parts from the, from the engine, except the seats, and the dashboard, except even the instruments are taken out, and the seats, seats are refurbished, and the bottom of the car, so there's nothing there at the bottom of the car. So essentially what we do is, we take a motor, which you can see the red color, and there's one gearbox, there's not a multiple gearbox. So the entire speed of the car is essentially controlled by the motor RPM. And then we, for the interim period, we use lithium-ion batteries. Now, you have to ask, because everybody is using lithium-ion batteries. Nobody talked about whether we have enough resources to have lithium-ion batteries. In this country, for example, one of the worries they have is importing a lot of oil from the Middle East because most of the foreign currency is going towards buying oil. And you see the dollar is going up, going up in this country because the cost of the fuel is going to go up. So what you are going to do is, if you do lithium-ion batteries, you, because you don't have lithium in this country. So what you are shifting is, from buying the petrol, you are shifting it once you are buying the lithium-ion batteries. Again, you have the same problem. So first we have to ask ourselves, is there a lithium in the world for having all these cars in the world with lithium-ion batteries? And you can see this is the statistics which I am going to read to you. Essentially, it takes 10 kilowatt hours of lithium for one every, for every kilogram. Every kilogram of lithium gives you about 10 kilowatt hours of energy. And right now we produce roughly around 100 million cars a year. Now imagine, it is true that you can possibly to build millions of cars, but we have to build billions of cars, not millions of more. So what, what essentially says is an unsustainable resource. So this isn't something. Lithium-ion batteries, the internal solution is okay, you are, you are not going to have greenhouse gases. Where? In Delhi. But however, when the lithium is mined, for example, in Bolivia and Chile, they are mining the lithium out there, and of course that is producing a lot of uh, greenhouse gases. And it is being processed in China, and that is producing a lot of greenhouse gases. And you brought it here in the process, you have to ship them here or you have to bring them here. All this entire cycle you see, there's a lot of greenhouse gases have been produced, but producing a car, of course, it's produced much less than what you had previously. So this is an unsustainable source. What are you going to do about this? So eventually the solution for India is not the solution. In term it's okay for right now. But the solution has to be a very simple solution, which is essentially what's called hydrogen. Hydrogen is a gas which is abundant anywhere in the universe. You don't have to import anywhere. It is in water. So what you need to do is, you need to convert the economy into electric, this lithium-ion based, from petrol to where moving to lithium-ion. We have to come to the hydrogen. And then the point of use, if you burn the hydrogen or electrochemically, or you can burn in the IC engine, for example, the output is going to be simply a water. So essentially, you're going to have wet streets. That's all you're going to have, simply when you're driving all these cars. And then the infrastructure which is already there, for natural gas infrastructure is already there, and you can use that to essentially create hydrogen. And this is a truly sustainable source. What you have to be thinking in this country essentially go towards it. France is already doing it, Germany is doing it, Japan is doing it. Of course, in our country where I live, we don't do it. Because our man is tied with a whole bunch of oil men, so we don't do it. But it is coming along. So what you have to do is you have to get into this activity, which is not very different. We have solved the problem halfway. We essentially have the motor and the gearbox. What you have to then do is you have to create a fuel cell and a tank. So when you have a gasoline car versus I didn't bring the video, if you crash both of them and all the flame essentially from the tank will go straight up. And the people inside the car will be extremely safe. If you do the gasoline cars, the entire car will get engulfed with them. And of course, most of you showed the Hindenburg, but Hindenburg did not burn because of hydrogen. It is burned because of the paint on the material. So that is what happened. So what you need to you need to have three components to it. You need to have three components to it. One is the fuel cell, which most of you, electrolysis and fuel cell are interchangeable. You take hydrogen and oxygen and put through electrolyte, you create electricity. And so essentially the tanks which you are making, the hydrogen is a very light gas. 
to carry it, you have to compress it. Typically, we carry this about at 700 bar, it was roughly 10,000 psi, which is not a problem. The, the, the tanks are there. Now you can buy these tanks commercially. And in a fuel cell, like we had 10 kilowatt vehicle for Alto, for example, that's what we use in the uh, lithium ion battery based vehicle. Here you can have the same motor. And the range for this car, if you have 2 kilograms of hydrogen, you can go 450 kilometers in this particular car. Now, how do you produce hydrogen? What you want to do is you want to do elect by electrolysis coupled with renewable energy. I give a simple example here. You take one megawatt PV plant, which roughly costs about four crores in this country. And you can produce 1.6 million units of energy from that. And that much, that many units of energy produces roughly 25,000 kilograms of hydrogen at 700 bar. Because I took into account of how much energy it takes to compress the gas. So it essentially produces 25,000 kilograms of gas by investing one megawatt of solar plant, which you can do. And that supports 100 subcompact cars, subcompact cars, running annually about 50,000 kilometers each, one megawatt plant. Now, what is the cost of this? If you take the profit, you take all the things because nobody does business without having a profit. So it costs you right now about 500 rupees a kilogram in India. Right now, you can buy commercial hydrogen at 2,000 PSI in the tank, which most probably you have in the lab right now here. You're paying 400 rupees. And it costs you another 100 extra 100 rupees doing all this electrolysis and all this process. And essentially, it costs you 500 kilograms or 2.5 rupees a kilometer. The petrol cost, the diesel cost, costs you right now 4 rupees a kilometer. And this is going to be 1.5 rupees. And then you can breathe. You can have fun. Your children can go outside and play, not wearing the masks to go into school. So if you look at engineering point of view, and if you look at the power on the vertical axis, and the horizontal axis is the range, and the solid red line to the left of that is essentially battery electric vehicle, to the right of line you have the fuel cell advantage. So that means in India, most of the cars, so you don't need Teslas here. You, need, you, don't, you are not driving very fast anywhere. Most of the cars, in this particular case, the taxis, which are running in the city, they're low power. That means on the, on the power axis, you are sitting at the low end. And what you really want is a range. You want the guy to have a long range for the car. As long as you want to have 450 kilometers. So for, for, your, for this particular purpose, for the, in the Indian context, the best solution is the fuel cell. And that is what you have to be focusing on. That's what the government has to focus on, to work on, to take all these cars, convert them into electric cars using hydrogen.